I've made millions of dollars just by moving my lips. How are you, Connor? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm great. So here's the concept. So, you know, like, so we've visited a little bit and you know how, like, I just believe in that community. I believe that everybody has this, um, has something to bring to the table because we all go through on this life journey. We all have these buckets. And in that process, we all have a bucket that we're overflowing from. Right. And the concept here is that folks come and they share from the bucket in which they're overflowing from. And if everybody shares from the buckets that we're overflowing from, and then we can collect from that and we just keep collecting, we'll all have all these buckets that we're overflowing from. With that, we have a bigger, richer, overflowing community, right? And that's the concept of this. Okay. Um, <laughs> Also, it's an opportunity for me to have conversations with really cool people and have it put on my schedule. It is. Well, it's also a good way to recruit agents. It's, uh, this podcasting, that's the way I got connected with Mike. And a lot mm. of my, I brought in some big people over the years into our group through podcasting. Because when you reach out to someone to say, look at brokerage model, you're going to get that kind of hand up. But when you say, can I put you in front of my audience and I give you a value? they're going to hop on the call and it gives you this time that we have here to start to build that relationship with them. Right. Uh, I've, been, I've been podcasting to grow quite a bit. How long have you been podcasting? Oh man, I've done a podcast on and off since like 2015, probably. It's 2015. Wild. Oh, that's, that's 10. You're going on a decade. Yeah. I got a YouTube channel out there a long time ago called investor army podcast. And uh, you can pull it up. It's, it's got like a hundred podcasts on it and you'll see how bad they were in the beginning. Like my, my, my camera wasn't even at the right range. So like the first video, the video is like this big and it's got a whole bunch of black stuff, but that just shows like how different social media was back then when right. I got on. YouTube, so when I got on YouTube, there wasn't even thumbnails. It auto generated just a screenshot from the video and you didn't get to choose what it was. It just pick one. So you'd have all these people like in weird poses and stuff. And then later, like they gave us the ability to put thumbnails and, and all sorts of stuff. But uh, yes, yeah, so I've been I've been doing it for a while. I so breaks on. If you were to start a podcast, a brand new podcast now, right? What what would it look like for you? How well, like what would that pro um, process look like? Like I had so I what I did is I got a framework from Brendan Burchard, who's our coach, right? So I got that podcast mm -hmm. framework. And mm -hmm. then I visited with Marguerite, got her framework, and I just did a step-by-step -step guide on that. But you, with a decade of experience, how would you start a podcast now today, starting from scratch? As far as like, um, like the questions I'd go through, or you mean like how many times a week I would do it, or who I'm trying to get on the show, or... Like if you were to start a brand new podcast on any yeah. subject in any form, like wait, like, like the world is your oysters. Cause right now you can pretty much do anything you want to do. Right. Um, if you just, <laughs> well, okay. Like you could do, if you could do a podcast on any subject in any form in anything, what would it be? Uh, it just something general, just like overall entrepreneurship and the, and the, pursuit of becoming a successful entrepreneur i wouldn't target it to like a, just a specific industry it'd be more overall reaching um okay. it's kind of what i focus on because like but if i was that's trying my to favorite build... subject just yeah. so you know that's exactly what i want to talk about today right so this is my favorite subject is entrepreneurship okay <laughs> like literally i know you're like i thought we were going to talk about exp no no i really... would talk about whatever if you don't no, mind, I, like my joy is really <laughs> entrepreneurship. Like I love EXP. I love real estate. I mean, two decades of real estate, right? Um, almost a decade at EXP. I, and the reason I love EXP is because it supports entrepreneurship. It's the right. platform that supports true entrepreneurship. Yep. Right. So if you yep. had a brand new podcast, Right. It would be really focused around entrepreneurship. Yeah. It'd be like yeah. my, yeah. 
I mean, love that idea. Overall general it, entrepreneurship. Yeah. Okay. General most, entrepreneurship. Most people, if you were to start a business today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we got a podcast as entrepreneurship. You're just going to start a brand new business today, knowing what you know and all the experiences that you've had. Right. So what would that business be? What, what genre would it be in? So I've, I'm just at a point in my career where I could, uh, you know, I did all the businesses I didn't want to do. So now I can choose which, what I want to put my time into. So yeah. I mean, I'm just kind of giving back to people now. And then also if I was to create a business, it'd be aligned with something like my hobbies. Like I'd go into like the fishing industry or something like that and, and create like a, a like a, a hobby type of business or something like that, that would give me the ability to spend more time doing my hobby but would also be profitable. So I believe if you can find a hobby that doesn't pull away from your uh, business journey, meaning it's just constantly absorbing all your income that you make, but it, you can actually turn a profit doing it. So uh, then you can get the best of both worlds. But I would do something that, that I have a lot of enjoyment doing. So mm -hmm. I'd probably do that. Uh, if I wanted to make money, I'd go into some type of business that had to do with attention and communication, some type of social media, something out there. Like you see a lot of people doing, they're going out there and building you know, marketing businesses, digital marketing agencies and things like that, because the future is a battle of attention. And if you can't get it, then you need to find someone that can get it for you. And then they're going to pay a lot of money for that because they waste a lot of money trying to figure out how to get leads and get attention and they can't do it. So a lot of people are desperate trying to find someone that can do it for them. But uh, that's, that's where there's a lot of market share in the AI industry. So would you utilize AI, market share, social media, to do something around fishing. Yeah, you could. So fishing industry is massive. I think ah. there's actually, uh, most people think like when they hear, hear fishing, I think they think like people are sitting there on a, on a dock with their feet kicked up. Like when I go out fishing, like it's, I, I fish like com tournaments competitively. We're in heavy waves. Like, you know, you fall out of the boat, there's birds flying, dive bombing you, sunburns, all that type of stuff. But, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, money in the fishing space there's i think there's are more you competitive are you competing right now in fishing yeah yeah i, I fish you were competing are you serious yeah i got a tournament tonight actually it's crazy that sounds no way. Where are you yeah. <laughs> on lake texoma so i fish uh the tuesday and thursday derbies and then i fish a bit like we fish the big weekend tournaments on texoma and then i'm going to be fishing in the bassmaster opens which is like the world series of poker, but for fishing, it's the highest level bass fishing. There's nine tournaments a year, but, uh, next year I plan to probably go into do two, maybe four of them. So have, so have you thought about turning that into your next business, like your social media, and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff? Because you're all, I feel like you can yeah. turn anything into money because of your experiences that you've had yeah. in your past that you really can turn anything into money at this point. Yeah. The first thing I was, the reason why, and I am turning it into a business is for expenses first off, so I can write them off. Uh, because I mean, I don't even want to tell people, <laughs> I don't know if we're recording this to actually go public or this is just kind of preliminary, but uh, I, I don't, uh, I spent a lot of money on the fishing. So fishing has gotten to where it's almost uh, more expensive than golf as a hobby. Now it's, it's, it's kind of expensive to, to do it, to do this. Um, now I don't even remember. You want to share with people your boat and and the rig and everything that you have set up. Here's uh, the thing, Connor. The thing is, is that I feel like you have earned the right for this because you have helped so many people, right? I think there's that that idea that that sometimes folks don't feel like they should share their success. But the only reason that you've been able to achieve, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, the only reason that you've been able to achieve the level of success that you've been able to achieve is because of the number of people and the impact that you've had in people's lives. So that's the reason I think that I'm so like excited about you to share, yeah. for you to share like all the amazing things that you are <laughs> able to do is because uh -huh. the only reason you've achieved that is because of the impact that you've had on so many people. That's right. So, so your income is, uh, 
their income and your net worth is a direct relationship to the energy of value that you put into the marketplace that came back to you. So in business, you don't get paid for time. You could literally work all day, every day for years and not make a dollar. You could actually go into debt or you can actually go bankrupt. But if you create value for the marketplace, meaning something of value, money will come to you. People will stay around you. So money is a, in a, is a, a measure of value that you've created for the marketplace, aka also what you're talking about, helping others. Because when you help someone save time, money, or emotion, they're going to buy a product, service, or opportunity from you. And so that's what we're trying to accomplish. But if we can create value for somebody else, they're going to exchange for that value with the dollars. And then that comes in. But it's also the um, the, the nature on how I believe most people should look at the world. We don't look at the world as a community anymore. We're all this broken down individualistic society. But the, I believe in the Zig Ziglar principle, which is the more you help people get what they want, the more you're going to get what you want. And so it's it's a cyclical process where everybody wins. So I think a lot of people are trying to say, well, I can't have what I have if you have something too. Meaning it, it's that lack of abundance people always talk about. Meaning mm. they need they need it all for themselves. They there's not enough room for everybody to be successful. So those are two different mindsets. One's very combative and aggressive and breaks relationships and has long term issues. And a lot of times they're the tortoise and the hare story where these types of people get off the ground, have success quickly, but long-term they struggle. And then the people that built the right cultures, uh, built the real relationships, did it with the good intent, did it to help people, to help you know their family, their community, their country, they usually take a little slower, but long-term they build something that's much more foundational, meaning that it has a stronger foundation and it's going to be longer lasting and, and it's going to uh, be much better. Yeah, sustainable. Yeah. And also just like constantly having less rework because what in businesses, we're always having turnover, whether it's W2 employees or agents in a team or contractors flipping houses. So the better your relationships are, if you're constantly having to turn people over and rebuild and redevelop relations, it's just going to put a drain on you emotionally and also you financially and also time wise to get to your goals. But, so um, have you always had an abundant mindset or was there a shift that happened in your life that, no, that got not you? Not really. There? What, what, um, was the, what was that trigger? What was the shift that caused that to happen and then allowed you to stick with it and grow from that in that mindset? Yeah, I mean, I think when I was little, just like a lot of kids, I had that belief system and in, in that kind of, you know, everything's going to work out and I'm going to have whatever I want in my life. And I think that's a lot of times what our parents put into us. And then as we get into high school and college and get into our early age, it gets knocked out of us by the brutality of the world <laughs> that we're living in. And we lose kind of our goals and our dreams and our and how we see the world in a positive light. And uh, so uh, I didn't go back until that mindset of, um, you know, I actually went through a really dark time for a long window. So I was a professional poker player for a long time. And the government regulation took that career and I had to start over in life. I got myself into debt and I was actually the opposite. I thought I was cursed. I thought God hated me. I thought, you know, why is the world so, so against me? And that, a lot of the thoughts that a lot of people have. And then um, I hit rock bottom. And I, I don't know if I've talked about this before. I actually almost took my life. That's how bad it got. And then the two things that happened that brought me back to the point of becoming the person I say people would think I am now is one, I started praying again. I brought uh, my faith back into my life. I'd walked away from my faith for well over a decade. And I just had a voice one day say, I didn't, uh, you abandoned me. I didn't abandon you. And it really hit hard. And I still give me chills of feeling that because that was part of me moving back towards that faith system. And then during that process, what happened at the same time was I came across the understanding of personal education, personal education, self-growth and personal development that a lot of entrepreneurs would consider that space. And I stumbled across the black and white recordings of Napoleon Hill's 17 principles of success. And that led me to think and go rich. And then I went down like this psychopathic, addictive, personal growth wave, like a lot of you guys did, which is like massive consumption of books and podcasts and skill sets. And, and, and I just realized at one point that I wasn't smart enough, strong enough, talented enough, qualified enough to be the person I wanted to be. But when I understood that I, I was the only thing in this world with a conscious mind, the ability to think and choose a thought, dogs can't do it, birds can't do it, but people can. I decided that I wanted to become someone better. And I and I put goals on pen and paper for personal excellence. And I said, what are the areas in my life that I want to improve? My physical health, mental and phys mental and body, mind and body, my finances, relationships, community goals, faith goals, all the different things that you, you know you want to have as far as a fulfilled life. And I started rating myself on where I was at and all those areas, and that was not very high. And I and so the good thing about being a human being 
as compared to anything else on this planet is you can become more and be more by working on yourself. And so I, I dedicated to skill set acquisition. I started studying myself and saying, what skill sets do I lack on and which one can I acquire that's going to increase my value to the marketplace? So if you speak one language and now you speak two, you're more valuable to the marketplace. You're harder to, to be replaced. So your replacement value is related to your income. So if everybody can do what you can do easily, like just like, you know, stocking shelves, your value is not high and no one's going to pay you a lot. But if yeah. you, you know, spent years on business like Bettina and myself and you built these skill sets up, it takes time to do this and sacrifice. Like Tom Brady, if you put him off the field, you can't just go put another Tom Brady on there. So right. the, the replacement value, the harder you are to replace, the higher your income, which is what you guys are chasing in business. And so the way that you become hard, harder to replace is you get you acquire the skill sets that others don't have. And you spend your whole life just stacking skill sets and building more value as a person. And as your personal value improves, so does the sphere of influence of people around you. Their personal values are going to go up around you. You're going to have more successful friends. And it mm -hmm. creates a new environment for you to grow through. And you're going to evolve into a different person. And it's really entrepreneurship is not a path to financial freedom. It's a path to finding out who you are as a person and uh, what you can stand up against and push through and what you can achieve. And, and the real reward is uh, once you've achieved it, knowing that you stood up against that, that difficult uh, journey and, and overcame it. Mm. So, <laughs> so, you know, I've got kids and we've, we, I, you know, I've shared this. I was like, okay, if, what, where would you say, like for my kid, I have an 18 year old. He just graduated high school. What would I say? Now, <laughs> yeah. What would you say to him? Well, he's going to Portugal um, for, I don't know, for a minute. Cause I think I want him to have that exposure. Right. Yeah. And uh, I think that'll be just that openness, just teaching him to be open, to learn, to just see that there's a bigger world out there. Um, but Outside of that, mm -hmm. what are just three? Yeah. Three tips. Well, if I, if I could go back personally, and so I know there's a lot of parents, so guard your kids' ears real quick <laughs> unless you want to mirror. <laughs> but uh, I would, I personally, if I could go back, I would have never gone to college. I would have gone straight into business. And yeah. I would have gone into business world at 18. And the first thing I would have done was I would have gone into sales. So if I had a kid coming out of college, I'd push him into sales or into network marketing. And the reason why sales and network marketing are important is we're talking about overall entrepreneurship. These are the skill sets that they're going to be able to acquire a lot of, and they're not going to have a big risk. When I got into investing, I was in a high risk, high liability business that I went a hundred grand debt really quickly. When you, when you join like a sales business, you're trading most of your time or your network marketing, you're trading your time, but you're also inside an environment with proximity to very successful people. So that's one of the big benefits of a network marketing company is you can join something for free or relatively low cost, but you're in an environment, not just like looking at someone's YouTube videos from afar, but working with some of the most successful entrepreneurs in your space. Now, also you're going to save that long window of time you know, going to college, let's say you're going to become an entrepreneur anyways, you don't really need to go to college. Most of the things that I, I learned as far as business came after college through my personal growth efforts, you know, our traditional schooling system in college. And I just was on uh, Sean Kelly's uh, digital social hour podcast. And uh, he, we were talking about education, how it's pointless, because what it is, it's memorization of stats. They want you to remember what year president was the president. And I was explaining, they don't care about what George Washington did or that he literally would ride a white horse onto the battlefield in front of all his troops and get shot at first, which you would never see a, a modern leader do this. They won't even, they won't even step out of the air conditioning house and then they just tell everybody to go die on the battlefield. But these leaders of the past literally put their life on the line first. They were the first bullet came by them first, but they want you to know president of this date, right? So there's, there's no value. So the school is about memorization of dates, statistics. It's not about implementation and, and really what, what matters there. Um, the meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Second thing is the time horizon, the, the, the ability to compound uh, entrepreneurship and your net worth over time, the longer, the, the longer you're in the game, the more you can have your money come in and out and cycle and compound and move forward and, and to expand your net worth. And also when you're younger, you, you have way higher energy levels. You're way more resilient because the world's not knocked out of you. So you can wait. I see a lot of the kids that come into our organization. They're 18 to 22. They're very tough. And that, and if things aren't going well, they just keep on doing it because they don't, they don't see, they, they don't see a risk of their time. Like someone that would be, you know, I turned 40 this year as compared to someone that's 60 compared to someone's 80. So 20, 40, 60, 80, we all live so many years. 
the lo- the older you are in life, the the less risk you take that have big time attachments to it. Because what if you mess up? You you don't have all that time. So when you're younger, you can take way bigger risks. I mean, I was a hundred grand debt in my late twenties and still got to where I got to. So I would say start out when you're young. Uh, go into some type of business like network marketing or sales where you're going to gain a lot of skill sets. Mm-hmm. Don't worry about it. Making millions of dollars yet. Be, build you as a person and and then uh, take big risk when you're younger because if you mess up, you can start over. You can live at home with your parents and things like I did. So you have the ability to, and if you don't, you can live and share dwelling. You can like get a place and rent it with three of your friends and really live for cheaply. Something like that. So that would be two. And then um, the third one is I would advise you if you're young listening to this i'm not saying don't educate yourself i said don't go to college there's a big difference big uh, difference yeah. yeah i mean personally educate yourself on entrepreneurship and business and wealth and making money so the first thing that i did was i said what do i want in life okay well if it's my financial goal i want to be wealthy okay what do i want well, who's wealthy let me study the wealthiest people in the world. So I started, started to study wealth. I studied Andrew Carnegie and Rockefeller and Henry, Henry Ford and Vanderbilt. When I wanted to study physical fitness, who did I study? Arnold Schwarzenegger. I used to study Bruce Lee. I used to study all the people. So whenever you want a goal or what you want in your life, look at the peak of the world or the top people in your industry, whoever's doing it, and study them. And so, uh, but yeah, that's kind of, you know. And I remember you talking about um, speed reading. So, mm-hmm. and... At what point did you invest in learning to speed up your processing and how did you go about doing that and what impact did that have on you? Um, it's really hard to tell exactly what's done it. I think everybody can speed up their, their cognitive abilities. But when I was little, uh, like when I was in like first and second grade, you know, I've, I didn't come from a lot of money, but I had great parents and my mom would, uh, she'd put me through times tables and like, they would be like X amount of math questions and basic division and multiplication, but I'd have 60 seconds to, to do like literally like 50 questions. So you're basically answering like one a second and she would put me through all these times tables. So I was really good at math and doing things quickly. Um, also later in life, uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons to go fast and everything, but, um, when I got into poker and I started making my living playing poker, the, let's say you can make, X return per X amount of hands you play. Well, now, however many hands you play is directly relating to your income. So if you can play 100 hands versus 200 hands in the same time window, you double your income. And so I started to play four tables at a time. Then I started playing eight, then 12, then 16. So I used to play on a big screen. I'd have 16 tables on like a four by four squared off grid. Now you're obviously not engaged on all 16 tables at all times. If you play poker, there's a lot of dead time. So you're folding off, let's say 16 tables. You may, you may be actively in two to four hands. You're folding everything off and then you're playing in certain spots. But I had to learn to make decisions quickly. And then also when I was working with, started hi- hiring employees and I'm always behind the eight ball uh, you know, with business, you just have to learn how to communicate quickly. So what I realized was if every skill set and everything I hold is equal, meaning I clone myself, everything's the same. Now there's two Bettinas or two of you. And the only thing difference is the speed of implementation of the skill sets, knowledge, and wisdom, and, that, and the things that you already have as value in you, you're going to get to your goals faster. So if you can read faster, write faster, talk faster, walk faster, you're going to get to your goals faster. So I just, it, you'll notice it's a habit it, when you're dealing with very busy, successful people, they mm-hmm. talk fast, they talk intentful, they make quick decisions, they don't go back on them, and and they're always moving quick. And they, they don't deliberate over decisions. They're not taking a week to make, like they're making, like, for example, I just bought a house and I walked into it for five minutes and, and was able to make the offer on it. So like you have to make decisions quickly because if I hadn't done that, I would have lost that deal. And uh, this is a house that was actually listed on the MLS. So if you guys are investors, there's deals popping up on the MLS all around the country right now, but you have to offer lower. So I'd wait till they're on the market for 60 days and have at least one price reduction. But um, I just got a house accepted. I think it was on the market at 260 and I got it for 210. But the reason why is because I'm out there being active and I'm communicating with people, but also... I'm doing a lot on an individual day. So the more you do, the faster, the faster you get your goals. Also, it's not just the speed of which you do things. It's the, the time on the calendar of how fast you acquire information and data. So let's say that you're going to read a book and you're going to read one chapter the first day of the month. And then not till the next first, second chapter, the next month, third chapter, Uh. you get to the future chapters. You have to come back reread kind of a little bit to catch up where you're at. So you always want to 
condensed things where if you just read the book straight through in one or two days, you wouldn't have to remember where you read, you wouldn't be lost. And this happens with any long-term project that you guys work on. If you're creating home study courses or you're building or you're writing a book or something like that, if you write one chapter, because everybody's brain wants to go, well, I'll write one chapter a week or one chapter a month. That's not how you do it. You figure out what you want to do and you're going to go, okay, I'm going to write a book. Now for the next two weeks, all I'm going to put my attention on is I'm going to write this book and m manage the other things around it. And you condense the time to it. Otherwise, you're going to increase your time schedule massively. Um, so it's doing things fast as far as a concentrated time, meaning how fast. Yeah. So same with XP. I, I knew it was a market share race. I, I put all my time in up front. I worked as much as I could as fast as I, could, as I knew every day. Do it a little bit each year. And I'll build it over time. I said, I'm going to front load my, my energy on this. And so I'm a big believer on condensing time and, and data in a short window of time to do it quicker. And then also just the actual speed of how we're implementing things and uh, how, how fast we're doing the things in our business. We're going to get there quicker. So speed reading, speed writing, speed typing courses are, are a very quick and efficient way to increase how fast you're getting things done. So what is your what are you condensing your time on right now? Uh, there's a number of things I'm doing. So I'm still buying properties, uh, with my, I still run my investment business. I'm getting a little bit more active right now on that, uh, placing money. So the first half of the year, I kind of get a good understanding of what all my businesses are going to kind of bring in. And then I know how much real estate I have to buy for tax purposes by the end of the year. So like the next, and also by the end of the year, as we move out of selling season, people will come off their property values a little bit more. So I'm, uh, working on buying about five houses right now, I think. It looks like we're going to get, uh, I still spend almost all my time running. The vast majority of my time is working on the team, but I do more leadership uh, things like creating, uh, running calls for them, creating presentations, doing three-way calls, uh, helping answer questions, going to events and things like that. And then uh, I've been getting back in shape a little bit. So we all kind of waffle through our health journey from time to time. I've had yeah. some health issues over the past like year or so. I fell off a mountain and blew out my knee. I should still have surgery and I'm no. putting it. Yeah, I literally fell off a, <laughs> I wiped Which out. Mountain? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was. I'd have to find out. I was in Seattle. So we went, I went my first and only time probably skiing. And uh, ah. we, went out, we went out all day and it was the last one. And it was, I got up to the top and I was like, I, sh I should not be up here. I've and, heard, uh, I've, this is, I've heard these stories. These are the stories that we hear. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I blew out my knee, wiped out. They had to, uh, like, it, like, they literally had to like bring the, the sled. Yeah, Did you get they, the sled? The sled is shame. Me off the mountain. Yeah. They, they took me off. <laughs> but, oh, um, that's awful. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it's not, I don't even know where we're going with that, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, so, uh, but I don't know. If, whoa, so, so, you're, you, so you're not. Um, so you, I don't know if you. So I was listening to Ed Milet yesterday, and I don't know if this is yeah. but he, a big part of his thing is that physical working out, and that has been mm -hmm. a big thing for him, and that really impacts his his mood long term, sure. and yeah. not being able to have that physical activity right now because of his heart. He's it's it's been torturous, but what he has, you know, and he believe you know God has a plan, but he's really. Um, stretching has been another oh yeah been I huge for him and i know you do a lot of stretching yeah as, a, as you get older especially because i played a lot of contact sports i was in three pretty bad car wrecks that i shouldn't have walked out of uh, so i'm a big believer in trying to take care of the body so i do a lot of stretching i do yoga rollers and things like that i do lumbar extenders uh i do things like um uh, plank boards where you stand on plank board inverting your the angle of your foot to get a deeper stretch uh, I, do, I ground I go outside I go grounding I go fishing I get out in the sunlight um, I have a PM PMF mat which is a red light mat uh, wait you, know, you have a PMF mat or a red light mat or it's a combo it's both it's, both. it's an infrared mat and it's it's got multiple capabilities to it but then I also um, I focus on like you know I, I like wake up and I drink like uh, Baja gold salt water just like to start the day off to get yeah. the right, you know? And so like I do quite a bit for like my body because I put attacks my body a lot. I work really long hours and uh, I have for years. And um, if you don't, it's going to break down on you and your mind and body work hand in hand. So when your body doesn't feel well, 
your mind's at attaching thoughts to, the, to those bad feelings, and then it's not focusing on the business. And so if you guys have chronic pain issues, a lot of us have alignment issues from sitting at a desk for so long. I'm always going to the chiropractor and uh, doing things like this, trying to keep my body there, because if I can clear my thoughts and it's not focused on pain or issues or feeling tired or low energy levels, if your energy levels are higher and there's no aches and pain in the body, your income is going to go higher in business because more of your time is focused on your actual business. And then so what supplements thing, are you taking right now? Um, not too much. I mean, just I take like D3, uh, basic multivitamins and pre-workout creatine and nothing too, too crazy. Uh, okay. You're not yeah. doing like a lion's mane or any kind of uh, cognitive um, supplements? Yeah, I mean, I got all sorts of stuff that I take randomly, like I like ashwagandha and like random stuff, uh, it, but like nothing. <laughs> Whatever that shows up, you're like, yeah, let me try that. Well, I got stuff that's like you got all, most of the modern supplements coming out now have little bits of lots of this type of stuff in it. Yeah. They're they're like multivitamins, so there's lots of little bits in like everything. But uh, ultimately, the best thing that's going to make your body feel well is water and sleep. Uh, I t so I I when I drink water now. I, I use a water filtration system. So I put my water, I, I get bottled water. So tap water is bad. Bottled water is equally as bad. And so I take the bottled water and I put it into a water filtration uh, filter, which is going to get all the plastic and the particles and all that out. And then after I go through that, I put it into this little thing that creates hydrogen water in it. And I put it in, it turns it into hydrogen water and then I drink it. <laughs> so... <laughs> I would, I'd say focus on the water that you're putting in you because you are water mostly. And then um, also you're sleeping the, if you're not getting good sleep, you know, you're, you're going to be tired and you're going to have low energy levels, which is going to create frustration. But um, one of the things that like why Ed is struggling there is because we all have an identity of how we see ourselves and his identity is this big, strong alpha you know, that he's always been. And then when he goes in the mirror and sees a reflection of the identity that he doesn't identify in his own mind, he feels inferior to the person he believes he, he is. And he doesn't like that person. So it's, it's attacking his self image and it's hurting his self esteem about, and that's why it's so frustrating. So it's, we're in not great shape and we go through a progressive wave in our life where we go into great shape, we get that progressive win. So anytime anything's moving or growing or progressing, we're happy, we're content, we're focused on the future. But anytime we're seeing results go backwards, we're regressing our, our physical shape, our bank account, our business, that's when stress, anxiety, uncertainty comes in. So progression is the, the key to happiness. If you listen to Tony Robbins and regression is the, the key to, to a frustrated mindset. And so Let's when say that one more time. The key to a frustrated mindset mm -hmm. is? Regression, going backwards. So mm -hmm. if you were if you made a hundred grand last year and this year you're going to lose 10 grand, you went backwards. Last year you were in sports, you scored 14 touchdowns. This year you're going to score 10. You know, anytime your performance. But you got to shift that, but you got to shift that momentum. Yeah. You got to break the slump. So everything's in cycles. You're going to go from winning streaks to losing streaks and you need to be aware of where you're at. But yeah, you have to break out of it. But usually, usually what happens is you were in a losing streak. You were not in great shape. You became aware of your not great shape. Then you went into that process of getting into a progressive winning streak. You worked out for six months. You got in great shape. And then as you got in great shape, you drifted and you you stopped going to the gym as much because you already got to how you, how you feel good. And then you start going a little bit less and then you start to trail off and then you're going to go down on that bottom cycle. And then when you realize, hey, I actually put a little chub on here or I don't like how I look again or and you start to notice again, that's when you're going to find the next cycle, when you're going to shift back into probably going back and working out. Uh, very few people stay consistent, like through all those patterns and just constantly go to the gym. They're going to fluctuate. So you're going to see people in different con physical conditions throughout their life. So that consistency, what? It, how have you maintained that consistency? Like, do, do, or how do you maintain that hyper-awareness? Or do you just stay in momentum? Um, no, I mean, we break momentum and all sorts of stuff. You can build it back, but um, you, f you just have to study yourself. You have to look at, first of all, you study your results. So if you track anything enough, you're going to have a ratio up here, which is what Jim Rohn will tell you. So if you go to bat, play baseball and you go up to bat 10 times out of 10, you're going to have either two, four, five, one out of 10 hits, you're going to have a ratio. If you make 10 calls to an agent or a client, you, so you need to study data coming in. So same thing with your physical body, you know, if you study your weight, weigh yourself compared to how you weigh before was your body uh, index. So you have to have an awareness of whether you're improving or 
are you progressing? Or are you regressing? Meaning, are you doing better? Or are you doing worse? If there's no measurement to compare, having a comparison effect, you don't know if you're slacking or growing. But um, are you tracking daily, weekly, monthly? Like, ha- what um, what are your like when not like physic? Like, I assume like you have like a your metric, your matrix, your metrics, your metrics. I'm like matrix or metrics. I had to actually <laughs> spell that in my head for a minute. So take your metrics. Are you like reviewing them? Every single day, are you reviewing? Are you nah. having somebody else do them, and then you come back and review them later? Like in your in your physical health as well as your businesses, and like how often is um, this in review? I used to be like when I was in the beginning, really getting going and like building skill sets and focusing on areas of my life. I tracked everything a lot more than I do now. Uh, just being transparent, I don't track as much as I probably should. But where I'm at now, it's more of a time management issue. Where if I constantly have to track everything I do it's just a lot of time and focus that I can be putting into other places. It's not the highest and best return on my time to, to, to track everything, but it, I have like an internal code inside me that's like unconsciously tracked. If that makes sense, because I've been doing this for, you know, well over a decade, I know where I'm at in all these areas. I don't have to go to like, you know, track it anymore. I'm your doing reflex it. Your reflex is there. Your instinct is there. You, you've refined your instincts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, but when you first started out, how, like, like when you said on the regular, was that like every day you went in and you're like, are, are you like the type of person, like when you start something new, you're going to track it every I single know. day and you're just going to be obsessed about that one thing every single day. Yes. Is that the way it's every working day. out for you? Every, every day. day. So if yeah, you were so going to start your fishing, entrepreneurial, social media business. Every day and as, bi- as big as I can do it. <laughs> so <it's- laughs> So, so yeah, so it's like what we're talking about with speed condensing time. So when I find the next thing that I want to really commit to, that I'm actually going to commit to, like it's all day, every day. It's it's no joke. Like you hear eat, sleep, whatever. It's eat, sleep, whatever you're doing. There's no balance. So like when I saw like when I was doing this, I guess it's flexing now, but like it's a cool thing to work hard. I guess it's weird when I was doing it, I didn't know that, but I, I had to work. I worked 1100 days straight. I didn't take a single day off for over three years. And I was in debt. So I was doing it because I was fearful. I was trying to get out of debt. It wasn't like I was trying to flex on social media. But yes, I worked every day for 1,100 days. And then there was a window of time for like a seven-year window of my life where I was working 12 to 18-hour days, 98 to 99% of the days over about a seven-year window. Like I I was taking maybe a half a day off on one day on the weekend. Mm -hmm. But now I can do it. But now if I don't want to work at all, uh, my investments, the businesses I built, create enough that I could literally, I could literally do nothing for the rest of my life if I wanted to for the most part. I mean, obviously I'd have to do some stuff, but what I'm trying to point out is I, I made a conscious decision to sacrifice all this time up front. And now you hear this when you guys hear this, you're like, he worked every day almost for seven years. You hear that, but will you go do it? Because in the midst of that, there's a massive sacrifice. There's a lot of times I could have gone on vacations with my friends and could have gone and party and could have gone hung out. I could have gone to the beach. There's a lot of you know, days I could have gone to the casino and played poker for fun. There's a lot of days that I wanted to go fishing that I didn't. And, uh, you know, all sorts of things, you know, so you're going to have to sacrifice. And I think people would rather do what we talked about, like with the book or whatever, they would rather not make those sacrifices and work 25 hours, 35 hours this week and 25, 30, maybe 45, one week, maybe, and, and go the slow incremental route. I don't believe there should be balance in the beginning of a business. I believe that if this is your business, that should be your main business. I mean, put your, put your attention on, get your business done, right? build it. And then once it's done, go do whatever you want with your life because now you have the time and, and money freedom. But if you're trying to find balance along the way, I think you're going to find that your path to your success is way slower, if not going to even happen at all. So I, I do think that a lot of concentrated work and effort on whatever you're building in the front side is the way to go. And I've, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs do it the same way. Yeah. Um, and that makes complete sense to me, right? It, like to me, that makes complete sense. I've never enjoyed the word balance. Uh, it, like <laughs> yeah. I've never seen anything that has been balanced. It's always been prioritized. Like what are you prioritizing at that time, right? Yeah. I, I, I don't know how that word balance became so like the, what people are striving for. And uh, I always try to replace it with priorities. And I love that you share this and you're so honest about it. So something that came up that was shared with me yesterday and I was like, um, and I, you know, this is where it's unless I can be less hardcore. 
I haven't achieved what you have achieved, right? I'm in a different season. Uh, so they were saying that this idea of pursuit of happiness is just like, like oh, it's awful. And uh, I think there was a philosopher who said that is everything that you need, everything that you need is already within you. It's just up to you to tap into it. So mm -hmm. happiness, it's in you. You need yeah. to become the person that can tap into it. There's no pursuit. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to do that. If it comes to happiness, it's already there. You just have to choose to tap into it. Oh, for right? sure. It's a choice. Yeah. It's a choice. And everything you need to know, it's already in, in you. You need to become that person to pull it out. Yeah. So, uh, right. yeah. So Jim Rohn is one of my favorite mentors will say the same, the same wind blows on all of us, meaning the environmental changes around us. So the NAR lawsuits, anything and everything that we go up against the, the elections and all this stuff. So we're all having the same wind hit us, the wind of opportunity, the wind of uh, change, the wind of challenge and all these different things. It's how you handle it when this external environmental force hits you. And some people say, where's the opportunity in this? And they're going to make a bunch of money with whatever change is. And others say, how did this just ruin my life? And it really is how you interpret the information. Now, I'm a big believer on our conscious thoughts, unconscious thoughts, and body-mind connection. And so what most people don't realize that helped me understand emotions later in life is that the way I feel my body is caused by a thought. And so if I call Bettina and I was like, hey, unfortunately, your best friend just passed away in a car wreck. She's going to start crying. She's going to break down. She's going to have a physical reaction in her body. Okay. Now I call her back and the example I give, let's say is a bad April Fool's joke. And I'm like, she's right here. We're just joking with you. Bettina. It's all, everything's fine. And what that means is before she knew her friend was fine, I put an idea in her mind that mm -hmm. she accepted with her conscious thought. She could reject or accept it, but she chose to believe that her friend passed away. Now the acceptance of a thought that's held in the mind caused the physical body to change. Tears coming out of the face, heart rate increasing, blood pressure going up. Now what that means is the mind will trigger the body to change, whether the reality of what's happening in the world is true or not. So the reality was her friend's fine, but she truly believed that she was passed away. And this is why belief systems are so important. If you don't believe what you're doing is going to work, you're going to act off it with your energy levels behind it. You're not going to put the time in as compared to if you truly believe what you're doing is going to get you to your goals. If you believe in yourself, talk about self-image, if you have a high self image and you really believe in yourself, you're going to go put more time in and you're going to push past the obstacles and adversities and take risks. But if you don't believe in yourself and you think everything's going to go bad and you're going to fail everything you're going to do, you're not going to take, take a step. But so you have a lot of emotional control. So with that, I know with that and with your failures and with the things that have come up, there's probably been times where you might've been like, let's say you're on your boat, big wave comes in, it's going to knock your, everything over, <laughs> possibly dump your boat over. There might be a panic, but you got to keep it calm, right? What is it that you, what is your process in order to stay calm in that moment when there's that, oh shit, I'm going to, I have the opportunity here to lose everything or keep my head so I don't make a, an irrational, emotional decision. How do you keep that physical from blowing yeah. you up? Well, short note, like if you have anything like that's that highly charging emote, uh, that's going to trigger that with that much emotion, came taught right now, wait to respond until the next day. Don't engage with that person, the party, the title company, the client. Wait till your emotions drop because emotion patterns spike and drop really quickly. Let's see, so. you can't. You're on that boat. Waves <laughs> come, some bozo comes blowing by, huge wake. Woo. Yeah. So years what ago, I decided... Do? Yeah. So years ago, I decided that the world's not fair and that there's always going to be good and bad and that there's going to be X amount of bad things that have happened to me throughout the year. And what would happen to me was, let's say I had like an agent leave or a tenant stops paying me or an HVAC goes out. Lifetime at the moment, I'd be like, oh my gosh, why me? Is it the worst time? It had to happen right now. And oh my gosh, you know, God hates me. All this type of stuff, right? Uh, oh, that's awful. <laughs> I wonder you yeah. were depressed. No, I'm just <laughs> Yeah. So, so like I'm taking it live time, like it's a negative, but right. as I realized there's going to be X amount of tenants, not pay you X amount of agents leave. So I, I, in my mind at the beginning of the year, just understand that there's X amount of this that's going to happen. So when it happens, it doesn't bother me like it should, because it's a fundamental process of the decision I chose to do what I'm doing. So like, if I'm going to be a, if I'm going to be a USC fighter and I break my nose in a fight, cause somebody punches me or kicks me in the face, I can't get upset about it. I chose to be a fighter. Mm. You chose so to get on that boat. Yeah, I chose to step into the ring of entrepreneurship. Step in the ring, yeah. 
I can't so, get mad at So when it happens, it. you're like, oh, check that happened. That that was the negative. Now I can move yeah, on. Let me go. I'm let gonna. Me go I have ten negative things that are gonna happen. There was there. I've got two yeah. out of ten. Eight more to go. Yep. And then it's also just like we're talking about before the law of polarity. There has to be a good in every bad. There cannot be something bad happening to you without something good happening to you. This is what, when you hear the glass half full, glass half empty. So like, for example, uh, I told you guys earlier, there was a tough stretch in my life that was a very needed stretch in my life where I almost took my life. Now, when my poker career disappeared, I went through like this two-year window where I was kind of lost in life. And I literally, it was my dark years. At that moment, as I was going through it, it, it was the worst thing that I ever had ever gone through. Now, in hindsight, looking back over a decade later, it was the biggest blessing God ever given me because if I did not go through that moment, for one, I wouldn't have become who I am now. And it also wouldn't have led me from that old industry into real estate, which is what actually changed my life. So simultaneously, a moment that almost made me take my life gave me a new life. And this is why when bad things happen, I don't really care what's happening around me because I know that there's good in everything. I'm going to look for the good. How do I win with this? Where is where's the victory? You know, so for like all the NAR lawsuits and stuff like that, like everybody's freaking out. Well, what that what does that do? Decreases the market share, less people putting time in. There's more more room for you to, to grow through. So if everybody's taking one foot off the battlefield and you put one more foot on and you move the opposite direction of the herd, you're gonna gain market share. But um so whenever something bad happens, guys, just remember the law of polarity. There's an opposite to everything. It, this is how our world works. You have to have there cannot be an op- not an opposite. So ask yourself, what can you learn from this? What can you gain from this? Where is the victory? Where is the opportunity? And as you start asking your brain those questions, it's going to look for what you're asking. It's going to look for the more positive uh, outcome. But if you're saying, this is the end of the world. Oh my gosh, this is going to destroy my business. My income is going to go down. How am I going to pay my bills? You're focusing on the wrong thoughts. But remember, you can choose your thoughts. Your conscious mind gives you the ability to accept or reject thoughts or choose to have to have the ones that you have. And so if you're believing that your friend's dead, you're going to feel horrible all the time. But what if your opportunity is there? How many people pandemic hit said my friend's dead, meaning the world's over, everything's over. It's going to be the worst ever. And then they found out their friend was actually alive. And then the market exploded, meaning what they believed was coming was a wrong belief system. The reality was the market took off. But think about how many people changed their business habits and patterns as the pandemic hit and didn't capitalize on that big run because they convinced themselves opposite of what was really happening. So I really study your your belief systems. So where your where's your next growth? Like right now, right? Where's your next level of growth do you see? Because you've grown up so much. Yeah. Where's the next area of growth? I mean I, so there's there's two goals that I'm gonna chase like outside of like my business, which is, so I played cash game poker for almost a decade. What got me into online poker and poker in general was tournament poker. So I always wanted to win a world series of poker event, really a bracelet. Uh, and then I was never, I never did that because online poker boom stopped because I was making money playing cash games. So I've always had it. I mean, I got a vision board right here with world series of poker bracelet. Uh, so I want to win a world title or a, a world championship ring. So the world series of poker circuit events come through Dallas at Choctaw on the 17th next uh, this month. So I'll be playing in a number of those. So I'm going to, at some point I'm going to win a world title in the poker world. <laughs> and then, oh, dang. and then That's on the cool. fishing side, I'm going to win a world title in fishing. So I have, my goal is to, to win world titles and in, in the two different areas that I spend my time as far as my hobby time. But as far as business, all my time pretty much goes into a, uh, my team and then my investing stuff right now. But outside that, the only thing I really focus on is physical fitness, the gym, uh, and working on my mindset. And then I spend all my time playing or fishing mostly, but also playing poker. Wow. That's really cool. So what is it? How do you do that? What are, what, how do you recognize? So like if any business you're going to build, right? So Mm -hmm. does, does that pattern apply to pretty much every business uh that you're like yes and no yes and no pattern so what are the patterns that you yeah. can recognize in any business like you say okay this is going to happen pretty much any business you can pretty much take this and you can like like copy paste it on any business like how what would that look um, like i mean the only thing that's really going to help you across all businesses is working on yourself and your and your communication ability so communication is what you should always focus on i've made millions of dollars 
just by moving my lips. I literally sit in a chair and do, do, I literally sit in one spot in the universe. If you look at the earth is so big, I literally don't ever really move. I stay in one spot and I use my words. So I, I want you to remember that you can make millions of dollars if you speak well and you can convey value to others in the right way. But um, what was your first question again? I, I was, you said. So, so actually that was a better answer than the question. <laughs> I just want to say that. And, and I just want to oh, also pattern, add that your answers pattern. are better than my questions. Let me give you one pattern here. We're, so okay, one of the things me. I'm going to go over is so for like this. So many patterns are going to overlap every business, but some are going to be uniquely to, for that business. For example, like what we're building is an override team building model. It's got seven tiers. So the first step of a three, three step pattern to, to be able to beat this game is number one. How does your business start? There's seven tiers. You have to build your first tier. You can't have agents on your second through seventh tier unless you personally learn how to attract agents. So your business does not start without your personal efforts. So tier one is your personal responsibility. So you have to learn the, the art of agent attraction and the ability to recruit agents. So that's level one. Once you beat level one, you've now figured out how to recruit agents in different ways. Now as you, you figured it out, now you have agents in your business on your first tier. Now how does duplication happen? They start attracting agents. So step two is teach agents how to attract agents. So you first learned how to recruit. That was your skill set that you acquired. Now level two is now you have to teach those agents how to recruit. So as you teach more agents that are in your business on your first and second tier how to recruit, they're going to start building out in businesses inside of your organization. So level two is developing your leadership skill sets, teaching how to recruit. So and then level me how to recruit. <laughs> it's going to be a lot longer call than this. <laughs> Maybe I'll come back. <laughs> home. Well, but, just, uh, if, if you were just to give me like a quick, like just a quick, like overview, like how do I, re how yeah. do you recruit? Yeah. I mean, so the fastest way to, to, if you don't have like any big background and big social media or anything like that, uh, I would, I would go to local networking events, find local networking events where you need to go anyways. I was going to, when I started out like financing events, attorney events, real estate, like anything that I was going to, to gain that skill set, anyways. So I'm getting the win no matter what for my time. But then while I was there, all I was trying to do is develop relationships with a handful of agents and try to get them to go to lunch or dinner with me that week and build that relationship. But that was all I was doing for the most part. I was bringing some in through my social media, but if I was newer uh, and I didn't have like a massive social media following, that was the first thing I would do is I'd go find the mass or find the local meetup groups that I need to gain skill sets in and go there anyways. And then while I'm there, network and try to build relationships because you need to have time. You're not selling just like a twenty five, like a thirty dollar product. You're actually asking a, a human being that has a family and, and a future to move their business over. So it's not something you want to press on people. You just want to develop that relationship. And, That's uh, interesting because um, we did we had a conversation with Rob Flick, and it's it's in here, right? That we recorded. He said the yeah. exact. He said very similar the same thing. Yeah. So I'm finding a common theme. Now, if you can do it the fastest way to grow is inbound agent attraction, but through social media, but that's, that's something that takes a long time to do and you're going to have to put some effort into it. But uh, if like, that's the fastest way that I would go about getting partners is to just go to build those relationships face to face uh, with them. But um, to go back to finish out, like what I was talking about with uh, the patterns. So the third one. So yeah, so we, uh, first one is recruit. Second one is teach to recruit. And then what do you think the third one is? Leader. Now that you have, yeah. Teach them to be leaders. Okay. So teach them how to teach how to recruit. So learn how to recruit, teach how to recruit, teach to teach how to recruit. So now that you've developed your leaders where they're now able to teach their agents how to recruit. Well, what did you have to do in the beginning? You had to re recruit and you had to teach how to recruit, but now your business is growing. So you don't have to recruit except minus keeping your tears open. You, know, you just need to keep training more people to recruit. But as you develop leaders that can go develop leaders, that creates duplication. Now, if you are not there or you're, you're not, if you, you want to look at yourself as replacing yourself, Yeah. find all the skill sets. And this is how you can look at any business, take any business that you're in, find the things that you know, that work, that absolutely, you know, work in the business and then replicate that skill set or that process within the people inside your organization so that they can do it in a way for the next generation to come in. And this is the same thing with big company instead of team building, they're doing it with corporate employees, with senior management, middle management, lower level management. And as they're going up, upper management is training lower level management and they're replay, you know, it all cycles through. But um how do you, you so be sometimes people like get frustrated because you said you burn or at the very beginning of this conversation, you say people uh cycle through people and then they burn mm -hmm. out. 
right? Because they cycle through people. How yeah. do, and that's, that is the challenge that I hear across the board. It's a challenge that I've had the, where it's having, it's, it's finding those folks who you can help become leaders or finding those folks you've taught to be leaders and then they leave. Like, how do you, how does that work? How do you, how do you make that grow and stick all at the same time? Um, so it's just going to be a skill set that you acquire from working with a lot of people over time. It's kind of hard to teach. It's just going to be a feeling of how you get with certain people. So you should, as you start to talk to lots of people and work with lots of people, you kind of can feel how they are and who they are based off their work ethic. Are they showing up their energy levels, their intentionality and things like that. So the, the ones that I see that are going to take it serious, I, I get, I kind of give them tests, I test them with their time and stuff like that. And if they're serious, I commit to them and I kind of apprentice them one-on-one. -on -one. So every year I take on a handful of people that I'm working very closely with developing a few leaders that have earned the right to have my time. And then I run the rest of the groups and like, overall leadership groups with the agents that have a little bit bigger teams. And then we run the overall group on the mass scale where we do mastermind calls for brand new agents all the way up to the experienced agents. So what's a common denominator with those that you mentor in this, like personally mentor? What is a common denominator that you look for and that you have found has achieved the success? Like what is yeah. that pattern? Because we're, we're talking about um, recognition. Yeah, I want someone that's got a hunger for massive success for sure, and that's not excited about getting to like 100k a year. Um, I want to make wait, wait, sure wait. you said say that one more time. They are excited. or They're not excited about getting they, to 100. They are excited. They about are massive. excited. I misunderstood. Yeah. I was like, wait, they're gonna, okay. yeah, yeah, that they're gonna they're they're gonna go for it and put it all on the line. Yeah, I want to make sure that this is their their main focus and their main goal, meaning it's the only thing they're going to be w working on. So like if I have someone that's a high level business owner, I got a ton of them, great, great partners, but they do too many things. They're all running four or five businesses. That's not conducive towards what I want to do as far as how to grow the biggest business. If I only have so many tickets or tokens, let's say my dad's taking me to the arcade, he gives me 20 tokens. That's 20 hours a week to work. Once I spend my 20 hours, I, I, I'm out of tokens. So I have to be selective on which games I play with those tokens, meaning who gets my time. And so yes. I want to make sure that this person that I'm going to, if this is if they're, I'm going to work closely with them, like apprenticeship, if they're not going to put 60 hours, 60 or at least 60 hours a week into what I laugh at on. 60. I just want you to know. I'm like, people say <laughs> oh, 60 hours a week. That's like so much. I'm like, what, what, how many hours a week are you just spending on scrolling on social media? I bet you that's 20 right there. Well, they've, right? Uh, they've conditioned themselves, uh, to thinking it's a lot. So let's say like yeah. you've, you've not run a mile in years, but you used to be able to run five miles pretty easily. When you've not run in 10 years, it's going to be hard to run a mile. But then as you start running a little bit after a month or two, then all of a sudden you can run two miles and three miles and you're going to get back to running five miles pretty easy. But when people jump into business or entrepreneurship, th that's kind of like they can't run, but like a lap or a quarter or half mile. What they got to realize is like it, it's a they need to build their conditioning up because right. let's say they really love what they, let's say I love bass fishing, but I, and I want to fish for 16 hours a day, but I'm not physically fit enough to stand for 16 hours a day. I can't get there. So what were a lot of these, if you guys are listening to this right now, why you're getting burnt out two to three hours in the day and why you're always thinking you need to check a text message or go get something out of refrigerators. You haven't built your mental conditioning for focus up. So your, your um, mind's fighting you there. So if you show up and you work a little bit, once you feel that urge to get up and you force yourself to stay there, that's like when you're trying to say, stop running, I'm too tired and you force yourself to run another half a mile. Like you, you need to push through that limitation of where, of where you're, but if, if you start working a three hour a day and then a four hour a day and then a five hour a day after six months, you'll condition yourself. And then you'll understand why these entrepreneurs work 12, 16, 18 hour days every day. It's not that big a deal to them at that moment because they've conditioned themselves. So now if you take someone like a David Goggins or a long distance runner that maybe struggled to run a mile at one point, you say, can you run five? They're like, that's my warm up. So you guys, if you're if you're struggling where you know where you're not able to put the hours in, it's a it's a conditioning uh, issue. It's not that there's something wrong with you. You're just not in shape mentally for for working out long hours. So think of it like running. So just condition yourself. So yeah. So they need to have it's like the, the main business that they're working on and that they're focused on it. 
and they need to be coachable. So what does coachable look like? Because I hear this word coachable a lot. So somebody says that, and I, I used to joke that, you know, it's like the next sentence isn't, yeah, but, right? You say, hey, do this. Yeah, but we take that out of the equation. That's an obvious one for me. What else mm -hmm. does it look like for you in a physical sense? I, let's say you say this and then this person, how does it play out for you? Yeah. So if there's already a proven way to being that something's been done and you explain that this is how this is being done, how closely are they doing it to the way that you said, is it done? So for example, like some of you guys know, I sponsored Mike Sherrard, who's the, the number one recruiter in the world. And if you've seen some of the XPCon speeches, when he came in the first month, I explained to him that we're going to do this through a three-way call system. And what does he say on stage? He put like 30 people in front of me and I closed, you know, all 30 people. Now, what he was doing during that time, what most people do when they're my partners and I'm doing three-way calls is they're daydreaming. They're just kind of sitting there or they're trying to thrust themselves in the conversation at an unneeded point anyways. Mike was taking notes and was studying me while I was doing what I was doing while I was building his business for him, which is what we're supposed to do, giving him time to build those skill sets. And then later he does that with his agents. So he saw how I did it with him. And then now he's doing three way calls with his agents. And then they saw how that was done. And that's how it moves through the system. Like if you start to see them doing the things that you told them to do. So like, if I told you between like, Hey, one of the good things, like say Rob Flick, how many people do you say go run lunch and learns? And then how many people ran them? So if Rob Flick sits in front of 10 leaders and says, Hey guys, I built my business through running local lunch and learns. And then two go do it and eight don't. And then it comes down to a Friday when Rob has two hours and all 10 people want an hour. So there's 10 hours. He can only give two as an entrepreneur. Does anybody guess that he would not give those two hours to the people that did exactly what he said? Because what he's, because it's not that it's, it's also respect to the partner that's sharing their time with, you. because if I ask a very busy person that I want mentorship from to come help me and they tell me exactly what to do and I don't do it, it's a disrespect to them and disrespect to myself because we just both wasted each other's valuable time. And then also I didn't even try what they said, which means I don't even know if it actually works. And then what's the point of asking them for advice if I don't take it and don't yeah. apply it. And so I think yeah. that's a big cost, all industries and all mentors and, um, yeah. I agree. By the way, we have lunch and learns every Thursday here in, in, uh, yeah. in Frisco. If you ever, if you have somebody in the area that just wants yeah. a community to come join and, yeah. um, but we've thrown in a mastermind at 11. Nice. Pat Hayes, Cause Pat Hayes was doing that. I, yeah. I don't have any great ideas of my own. I'm just letting you know, I, the joke in my family is that I'm just a parent. <laughs> People are like, you're so smart. I'm like, I'm really not. I just cop, I'm a great copycat. So 11 o'clock, just so you know, 11 o'clock mastermind sponsored lunch at 12. Um, and then the model explained at 1230. We do it every Thursday, except title companies close this Thursday. Yeah. Kind of. I know I'm trying to get a house closed and Friday, most of them. But, uh, but yeah, like if you look at this commonalities between a lot of those like talking points, what do they all have? It, they all relate to can this minimize the risk of the mentor that you're trying to get time from? Meaning from Bettina's like, if I'm trying to get time from Bettina, if she thinks I'm going to waste her time and not do what she says, if she thinks I'm going to put all my time in other businesses and you know, all the, she's not going to want to help me and she's not yeah. going to want to help me with the full ability of her full intent, all her heart into it and emotions. She's not taking it serious. But if she knows like I'm waking up early and going to bed to late every day, she's going to go on the battlefield and fight. She's going to run at the speed that I'm running at. And, yes, uh, we that's, are. Yeah. And this is so, that's what's so great about you. And I know you have given back so much. You led the beta calls um, for a month, maybe longer. Uh, you yeah, contributed four, four so much. <laughs> four, four months? Four months, yeah. Oh, that time went by yeah. fast. You were yeah. so good. And I learned so much from you during that time. You, you shared. And what was so impressive is that you not only shared the your success, you shared the what's not to do, like the hardship that you went through so that we didn't have to learn, go through that hardship that you went through. You shared that wisdom. And that to me is that it takes a lot of humility to do so that we don't have to go through that suffering and still gain from your experience. And I have so much great respect for you for everything that. that you do. And well, um, I appreciate, well, I appreciate that. I genuinely do. And it's because you're my partner. And I know people don't think like that because I see there's, there's, and I'm going to bring this up. I'll probably touch on this in the presentation at build because I want people to understand this. 
there's three battlefields or three arenas we play this game in. We play EXP agents for CXP agents competing for market share coming to EXP. Meaning if there's John Smith and both Patina and I want to partner with John Smith, only one of us can partner with John Smith. So there's a competition right. within the company, but then there's a competition within the industry, which is EXP versus KW, EXP versus flat fees and copycats. So on one battlefield, we're competing against market share against each other, but on a different battlefield, we're competing with each other because as the XP does better as a collective, we all do better as a whole. So there's, so that's where we're partners. We need to all work together to, to, to win EXP versus the industry. And then the third battlefield is in your mind, your personal battle with your own self and your own thoughts. If you can't win that battle, it doesn't matter. You won't even get to the, to the, to the stadium for the, the other two to play. So the right. first one is, yeah, build, build, fix your mind first and, uh, and then go fight those other battles. Well, we, it's, it's, uh, I think ha Hank Havoc brought that up, um, initially and it, and it's something that spoke through to me because I love how you use a battlefield and this is where I feel so girly and I'm like not trying to sell, sound like I'm not coachable. So, but I'm just sharing my mindset. It's the same idea. It's my son. He's plays soccer, right? Yeah. We're all on the same soccer team. There's 18 that want to get on the pitch. The best player gets on the pitch, right? In practice, everybody plays up, levels up because it makes everybody better. But you're competing against this person to get time on the field. But also you're giving your very best because in that very best, we make each other better. When we okay. get on the field, we set aside our competition to get on the field because at the end of the day, we're going to win that game. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a good, important conversation that the, I wish everybody in the company would hear because like when I came up, I heard bigger brands and all these people and I'm like, oh man, I heard all these negative things said. And then later you get to meet them and you realize they're just kind of, they're, they're not who I thought they were based off of like what people are saying. There's like a big agent here. She's an old school agent, been around forever. And everybody says she's such a ball buster and all this and that. And she's like, just a nice, she's just successful put that way. And people are, are challenged by her put that way. But, um, yeah. I think the problem that we have is, and this is why if you understand these three battlefields, if I go and let's say there's an agent talking to Bettina and I'm bashing Bettina behind the scenes and say, oh, Bettina's bad and blah, 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 like the opposite of what she just said she would say for me. What does that do for the image on the outside? People are looking and they're like, oh, well, they're, they're all nasty and negative. And if we're doing this on a systemic level across an entire company on almost 90,000 agents, it's not good because we're always trashing and bashing each other. So in sports, like I played football, if Patino's on the other team on Sunday, I want her to hit me as hard as she can. If she's coming up the middle, we're going to hit each other as hard as we can. But if she lays me out, I want her to give me a hand up when the play's over and say, good play. And yes. same thing, I'm going to give her a hand up. And that's, and you, in sports, we played other teams. And then after the game, we go out and eat dinner, go hang out, go to the bars or whatever. So right. the point is be competitive, but hit each other and play fairly the best that you can. What's the problem is people are now, instead of trying to hit each other head up, they're like, well, Patina's not looking this play. I'm going to chop her off at the knees and take her knees out and try to injure her or she may actually have surgery in real life and real life problems. So if we can get back into a mindset where it's like competitive, let's go and hit each other hard, but pick each other up and then go and hit, hit the industry hard and pick the industry up. We're going to be a lot better than if everybody keeps trying to chop block people's legs out from under them and hurt them. Well, let's look at this as a team as like that. Let's just use that soccer team analogy, right? You have that teammate. Let's say there's 18 on the roster. There's, a, there's 18 on the roster. You've got a uh, player number 17. He's that player. He's going to knock out that. Everybody knows to look out for him because he's out for himself and he'll take you out in practice so that he can take your spot in the game, right? Do you think he's going to be in this? Do you think? those players are going to make him look good so that he can join the team next season. Right. Or do you think he's going to get emotionally pushed out? Yep. He's going to get pushed out. He might be able to get that spot, but nobody's going to want him on the team. Right? right. And I think at the end of the day, he, he's not going to make it long haul. When he, yep. if you're the, if that's a mentality, if that's a short game that you're playing, you're not making it long haul. And what kind of a miserable life is that anyways? Right. And then you have a reputation. And also, if you have if you're that team and you know this, there's those teams that have a reputation where they work well together and everybody wants to be on that team. They're champions because there's teams where they're really good, but they have a bad reputation because the camaraderie is bad. And then there's mm -hmm. also those teams that are really good that have great camaraderie. 
everybody wants to be on that team and fight on that team. I've had the privilege that my son has been on a really great team. And I've seen a lot of teams. We've built um, soccer academy. So this one's really like, I get this. I get what a cancer looks like on a team. I get like yeah. the personalities. I get that. And for me, that's so incredibly clear. And I look at you on the team as an all-star player that also builds up the teammates. Well, thank you. And, Appreciate that. and that is what makes a team better, right? That's what grows a team. And every so often, there's going to be that one player that that accidentally gets put on the team that eventually will get cut. But that person does not dictate the culture of our team. And I think it's folks like you that have dictated the culture that we have here and are growing here at EXP. And, well, I, have, and I appreciate that. So I appreciate it. On, yeah. so I, I love you and well, I appreciate you. everything that you've shared. Um, are you really going to start a fishing business? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I already got a fishing IG page. I just haven't turned it active, but, uh, so I'm going to travel the circuit, uh, the Bassmaster circuit and it's not cheap. Like a, a tournament's like $5,700 buy-in. And then you got another probably, they're like 10 grand probably almost for a tournament to go to. So is I, if I register everything and get it set up right. And then as I'm doing like you know, tournaments and winning and cashing uh, in them and things like that, I can write it off. And so, yeah, I'm going to register that business for the expenses and, and things like that. When are you doing that? It's, it's not, you just set up an LLC. <laughs> it's not I like I'm trying win. to. Like, I'm, like, I'm like, I already know, <laughs> like you've been adding up these expenses for quite, I'm like, why hasn't that already started happening? <laughs> it would, uh, yeah, it would, to go back earlier, like on like stuff, like it would freak people out. Yeah. So like my fishing lure collection is probably worth like, I don't even want to tell you guys. <laughs> should, so, should I say so here's the thing. Go, I, I think it's people. time that you just go ahead and activate that account. Just run down to the courthouse, get that LLC really quick. And then yeah. we'll just start like going over each one of those things. Your following like will be, um, will, would just be so massive, so quick, so quick. One, because you have the skill set. And two, you already have everything that everybody wants to know about and your ability to communicate that because you've been a sitting lip mover for so long this is <laughs> going to be a phenomenal channel what is yeah. it going to what is it called well i haven't i haven't said if i was mainly going to start an instagram page first but it's called uh the bass wolf, <laughs> <laughs> the bass, bass, wolf. wolf. <laughs> bass wolf for large because that's what i catch i go after bass large oh bass. i love that <laughs> That's going to be uh, fun. Yeah. I'm excited for you. I hope you do that quickly. I think you're going to, I think you've earned that, that place for you to do that and go down that. Cause you're doing it anyways. All you got to do is just yeah. turn it on. I just, but, uh, I just want to tell you, I love you. I appreciate you. And I thank you so much for always pouring into us. And um, if there's anything we can do for you and I'm, I can't wait to see you. Here in about a week, two weeks, three weeks. Yeah, yeah. No, you do. You do plenty for me. I'm very grateful. Uh, grateful to have you as a friend and a partner. So now that everybody knows we're all partners, so let's let's go out there and take over the industry. 